everybody. How are you? So, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I just give a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit more of the biographical information. So I grew up in Philadelphia, uh, and then I went to Boston College, came back, went to medical school in Philadelphia, and then went far west to Honolulu, and have worked my way back to Phoenix and kind of have stopped here. I'm married. I have three children. Uh, I'm in the herring age of a 16-year-old who's learning how to drive, a 14-year-old, and an 11-year-old. So they keep us pretty busy. Um, when I went and did my fellowship at the House Ear Clinic, uh, 2000 to 2002, I came to Arizona. Uh, there was a lot of opportunity, a lot of clinical need here, a lot of people who needed my services. And, you know, uh, frankly, what I wanted to do is I wanted to do a lot of ear operations, and I succeeded. I do uh, quite a substantial amount of operations. But one of the things that was fascinating was I would see patients who uh, we would either do ear surgery on and they needed hearing aids, or patients who would come asking if they could have ear surgery and they couldn't and they needed hearing aids, or patients who just needed hearing aids. And I would say to them, you should go get well-fitted hearing aids and we should follow you and see you back in a year. And so uh, as I tell patients now, I think that's an easy thing to say and oftentimes a hard thing to do, right? So what would happen was I would tell patients to go get well-fitted hearing aids and not infrequently people would come back and they'd say, I'd say, well, where are your hearing aids? And people would say, you know, I tried three pairs of hearing aids at three different places and I was in the trial period and at the end of the trial period, I returned them because they didn't work. And so, you know, I kind of thought to myself, well, well why is that? And I started to dig into the literature and look at it and simultaneously what's happened in the medical field is there's been an evolution to show that hearing loss matters medically, meaning when I first started out my practice, they said, well, why should I get your hearing treated? I say, well, you know, it annoys your spouse and your family and you can't communicate as effectively. And you know what? Oftentimes people say, say, well, I don't care if other people can communicate to me. That was a very common response. And, you know, it's, a, it's definitely a point of denial about your hearing loss, but it's also something where now at this point there's compelling medical evidence that you should get your hearing treated. So my concept now, and I'll talk about it a little bit, is, is is if, if you have a medical problem that isn't being treated, then medicine, meaning the group of healthcare, is not adequately treating the disease. And I would tell you definitively, hearing loss is a poorly treated disease across the board within the United States of America. And so uh, if I continue, let's say I operate for another 20 years and I do 500 surgeries a year, that would be 10,000 people. And that, it could be a very satisfying thing to walk away from my medical practice and say, I help 10,000 people. But the reality is, is probably only two to 3% of people with ear problems need my surgical services. But a lot more people need medical care and they need to better understand hearing loss. <laughs> so although I continue to have a vibrant surgical service, a sur surgical practice, I now have kind of rededicated myself to increasing awareness about the treatment and significance of hearing loss and how it impacts people and how important of a medical thing it is to treat. And that's one of the reasons I'm here to talk today and to talk to you about some of the insights that I've garnered from talking to patients over and over again about their hearing technology and why they have a problem. But what I would tell you, if there's anything you could take away from here, if you want to talk about hearing aids, there is a difference between getting hearing aids and having your hearing loss treated. So getting an object put in your ear called a hearing aid is different than getting your hearing loss treated. And that probably is one of the fundamental problems why people have hearing technology but still don't hear as well as they'd like to. So we're going to talk about this. So I'm going to go through various different topics because these are the things that as my interactions with people, they ask me. So one of the things is, is, is people ask me, what's the difference between a cochlear implant and a hearing aid? Okay. And so the fundamental concept is, is when people look at nerve hearing loss inside of the hearing organ called the cochlea, there are little receptor cells, they're nerve endings. And those nerve endings are called hair cells. That's just what they're called because they look like little strands of hair. And when we look at most people who have a nerve hearing loss, they have degeneration of these hair cells. Okay? So when you have a hearing aid, you essentially are trying to drive more information and more sound 
through those broken receptors. Does that make sense? You're using people's native hearing system to send the sound down the ear canal, hit the eardrum, go through the three bones of hearing, and stimulate the nerve endings within the cochlea, which are broken, which is why you have a hearing loss. The difference is, in a cochlear implant, we put little electrodes inside of the cochlea, and those electrodes <coughs> directly stimulate the nerves beyond the broken receptor cells. Does that make sense? So a hearing aid drives through the broken receptor cells, a cochlear implant bypasses the broken receptor cells. And that's essentially why a hearing aid for some people gives them volume but does not restore clarity. And a cochlear implant for the appropriate patient can restore both volume and clarity. So that's the fundamental difference between the two. People ask me, what's the difference between a Baja and a cochlear implant? The first thing I'm gonna tell you is, is it's unfortunate that Cochlear Corporation owns Baja. Because people come in and say, I want a cochlear. And it's like, well, do you want a cochlear implant? Do you want a cochlear corporation device? And oftentimes people are coming in who want a Baja, but because Cochlear Corporation, the maker of one of the cochlear implants, also owns and makes Baja, people get that all confused. A Baja is a conduction device. It is a vibratory device that essentially vibrates your skull and sends the sound to your hearing organ. It assumes that you have a functional hearing organ. So it is a subtype of a hearing aid essentially as compared to a cochlear implant that bypasses those broken receptor cells. So that's the fundamental difference between them. The last thing everybody asks me oftentimes is, can I cure tinnitus? It's tinnitus or tinnitus. You can pronounce it either way, like Caribbean or Caribbean. There's no right way. I say tinnitus because, frankly, you can say it quicker than tinnitus. Tinnitus is a sound in your ear that doesn't exist externally. Okay? So when people talk about curing tinnitus, I talk about other diseases. The two most common diseases in the United States are high blood pressure and diabetes. Can anybody here tell me the cure for diabetes or high blood pressure? There isn't one, right? We don't cure those diseases, we manage them. We help to treat and manage them, but we don't cure them. For some reason, when people come in and they want, it, they want tinnitus cured, but we don't cure many diseases, we manage them. So what I tell people is tinnitus is not a curable disease, it's a manageable disease. And so it's a mindset thing where some people are like, well, you've got to turn this off. Well, I would love to turn off your diabetes. I would love to turn off your high blood pressure. And I would love to turn off your tinnitus. But let's not ask medicine to do for tinnitus what it can't do for the most common diseases that occur in the United States. So it's a bit of a mindset about the disease. This is a common thing. People tell me, I know people are talking to me, but I have a problem understanding what they're saying. Many people will just say, I can't hear them. And I would say to them, well, how do you know they're talking to you? Well, because I know they're talking to me. I said, but so then you can hear them, right? So hearing is detection, understanding is different. So the first thing I tell hearing impaired people is, don't tell people you can't hear them, because what do they do? They yell. And it's no easier to understand yelling than it is to understand normal <laughs> speaking, right? So part of it's the language that you use. So if you say to people you can't hear them, get ready, they're gonna yell at you. So you need to say, I don't understand. So that's your job in terms of how you communicate to people, right? So when you look at words, they're made up of vowels and consonants, right? A, E, I, O, and U are the vowels, and the consonants are all of the other things, the softer parts of words, the parts of words that give them meaning. So the F and the P and the S and the D. And that's why people confuse wife for wipe or wise for wide because most people who have a hearing loss of aging, which is the most common form of nerve hearing loss, lose the high tones more than they lose the low tones. So you can still hear the vowels, but you can't hear the consonants that give the meaning to the words. And that's why women's voices are more difficult and children's voices are more difficult. And usually the most brutally honest person in the room is the grandchildren who look to the mother or father and say, grandma or grandpa can't hear. Right, because they don't have the social restrictions of not saying things that aren't necessarily proper. So they're the ones who are usually brutally honest. Right. So I use the example of Wheel of Fortune. Right. Everybody's familiar with the game Wheel of Fortune. Right. In Wheel of Fortune, you can buy vowels. 
Why can you buy vowels? Because the vowels never solve the puzzle. That's the part you can hear in the hearing loss of aging. It's the consonants, the softer parts of words, are the parts of words that give them meaning, which is also the part that solves the puzzle in Wheel of Fortune, which is exactly where the hearing loss occurs. And that's why it's so hard to solve the puzzle, or hear, or understand. Background noise. This is another common thing that everybody talks about. Okay, so what everybody tells me is, is they cannot hear in background noise. Okay, so there is a concept within background noise talking about what we call the signal to noise ratio. So the signal is what we want to hear, and the noise is what's in the background. Okay, so if the signal is high and the noise is low, you can understand the signal. If the signal and the noise are the same, it doesn't matter how hearing impaired you are or you are not, you cannot pull out the signal from the noise. It's that simple. So if you go into an unfavorable environment with a poor signal to noise ratio, which is basically most restaurants that have quick table service, you will not be able to hear. So the second point is, is normal hearing individuals have problems in restaurants. It's important for you to understand that. Normal hearing individuals have problems in restaurants. So if you're hearing impaired, my advice to you is socialize as a party of four. Why is that? Because when you have four people at a table, how many conversations occur? One. As soon as you add a fifth, two. You're increasing your own signal to noise ratio right in that conversation and you're impairing yourself from being able to communicate. When you look at restaurants that have very, ra restaurants make money selling food, not selling conversation, correct? Right, so they don't make any money if you sit at the table and talk. So on purpose, the way they get the tables to turn is they add noise. So if you walk into a cheesecake factory in the middle of the day and it's empty, guess what it is? It's loud. The reason is, is they are actually piping in sound. They make it purposefully cement, concrete, Granite, they want the sound to bounce around because they want you to eat and go because then they can flip the table. So the price, so if you want to go to a place where it's nice and it's friendly, it will have carpet, booze, wallpaper, and drapes. How many restaurants have that? And what's the price of the entree? Right. So those are the restaurants where they don't have to flip the table and they serve one, one person at that table all night and they make as much money, I guess, as you can at Cheesecake Factory where you flip it multiple times. So unfortunately, the cost does determine how friendly the restaurant is for hearing impairment. And they're not looped, that's for sure. Communication hygiene. This is another thing that I think is really important, especially between spouses. And so what I tell people is, is you need to get people's attention prior to speaking to them. You need to get in front of them and get their attention. Because the hearing impaired person is trying to catch on to what's being said as it's happening. They're processing, they're trying to figure it out, they're guessing, they're thinking what they are. And what they'll do is, is they'll wait till they get about three sentences down the road. If they haven't figured it out, they'll go, what did you say? And the reason is, is they don't want to get 30 sentences down the road and then say to you, what did you say? Because then you get really frustrated because you've spoken for two minutes. They haven't understood anything you've said. They're derailing the conversation. They're like, well, why did I just say that for two minutes when you didn't understand any of it? You will do better to get their attention first and then speak to them. Normal individuals should not try to speak to each other from different rooms. I'm not sure why hearing impaired people will say they should be able to. I'll just confess to you about my own marriage. My wife likes to try to talk to me from the other room. She stopped. What I first started doing was saying, you're not talking to me from the other room. That is not a winner. <laughs> it is not a winner. So now, you know what I do? I ignore her. Because the point is, is if she wants to have a conversation with me, she can co-locate herself into the room I'm in. What I'm doing is important to me, so I shouldn't have to stop what I'm doing to go speak to her. So I'll just assume until it's important enough, she'll co-locate herself to the room I'm in. Otherwise, I'm not going to respond. The I didn't hear you or huh, it's not as good as just, just not responding. Because when you say you can't hear them, it just becomes more and more frustrating. And they oftentimes externalize it to your hearing loss rather than their poor communication hygiene. Do not turn away from the person. Saying something like this and going like this so they can no longer lip read does not help them. You need to get directly in front of them and give them as much information as possible. 
And multitasking and hearing don't mix well. So I have patients come in, well, the problem is, is we can't have conversation while the TV's on. It's like, well, I'm not sure if we're supposed to, you're, maybe you should watch TV or have conversation, but maybe not both. Or I can't have conversation while somebody's washing the dishes. That's right, you can't. Normal hearing individuals can't either. So another question I always get is which brand of hearing aid matters? So most hearing aid companies are multi-billion dollar companies, not multi-million, multi-billion. Some of them are order a magnitude of $10 billion companies, okay? So they spend hundreds of millions of dollars on research and development, and they want you to recognize their brand. They want you to buy their brand. They want you to think that their brand matters. And they hate for me to say this, but I don't think the brand of the hearing aid matters whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The point of the matter is, is if you look at cars, there's no single car manufacturer that makes the best in class starting at a subcompact going all the way to a full size automobile. There just isn't. So to presume that there's one manufacturer that has the best in class hearing aid for your particular hearing need is just incorrect. The reality is, is what you need is a good hearing provider that matches the correct device to your need and to your hearing loss. And not everybody needs top-end technology that streams their iPhone. And some places just want to sell, say everybody needs the top, but that's not really true, right? Not everybody needs an automobile that goes zero to, four, zero to 60 in four seconds. The point is, is not everybody needs the high-performance model. What I suggest you need is a hearing device that a well-educated professional can match to your needs. So a, an elderly person who's in a nursing home whose family visits them once every three months does not need the same hearing aid as somebody who's in high-level meetings eight hours a day. And if, you're, if somewhere you go just does that for everybody, they really don't understand the concept of getting the right hearing device for the right person. The level of a technology needs to match your lifestyle. So I'm not a big car guy, but I do use this analogy. There are people who want a sports car performance in their hearing aid, but they only want to pay for a Dodge. <laughs> and the reality is, is you're not going to get that. So don't make sure whatever level of technology you get, it matches what you're looking for it to do. The, the, the thing is, the way these companies make money, <clears throat> understandably, is as they improve their hearing devices with technology, with you know, background noise canceling technology, things that they spend hundreds of millions of dollars researching, wireless technology, they charge you more. That's how they make more money. So the more features and the better the hearing experience, the more expensive it is, which is the same, right? Car with leather interior navigation costs, and power windows and power steering and power brakes cost more than something with none of that. And that's just, that's the way they all, that it works. So people need to know about the most common pathway of hearing. And the reason I put this up here is, is you know, there's the hearing device, there's the outer <coughs> middle ear, there's the hearing organ, there's the hearing nerve, and there's the brain. And one of the fundamental things is, is oftentimes people tend to focus in on one particular thing. They'll say, my hearing aids don't work. Well, maybe your brain doesn't work, <laughs> right? Maybe your hearing aid does work, but it's not adjusted correctly, right? So that, I think, is one of the biggest struggles for patients is knowing exactly where the problem is, right? And so that's an important thing that we'll get to a little bit further down. So what I'm advocating for is what I would call verification across the entire hearing process, right? So that means you've got to verify the hearing aid, the ear canal, the eardrum, the ear bones, the cochlea, the nerve, and the brain, not hey, you've got a hearing loss, let's put a hearing aid in your ear. And there's a little bit of a difference, which means from what I'm talking about is medical evaluation if needed, audiologic evaluation, programming with a real ear measurement, and outcomes. So we'll, the first you probably understand, real ear measurement. What is a real ear measurement? When you get a hearing aid, if you think of a pipe, okay? If I have a certain amount of water going through a pipe, okay? The size of the pipe determines the amount of flow. Does that make sense? The size of your ear canal determines the effectiveness of the hearing aid. That's an important thing to understand. So the reality is, is the only way to know that a hearing aid is working for you is to measure its performance within you. 
and a real ear measurement involves putting a little microphone down your ear canal and putting the hearing aid in and then testing how the hearing aid performs. That is true verification of the fit. And outcomes is we can do testing to measure how well you understand in the booth. We can test your understanding. We can add background noise. We can do all of those things. Not the most common complaint I hear is, I do really well when they pro program my hearing aid at the hearing aid place. And then when I go out in the real world, I don't do well, right? That's because you've been programmed to hear well in a booth, not in the real world. And so we do do things to simulate the real world to see how you're doing. So that's one of the things that I hear is a very common complaint for people with hearing technology. I tell people craftsmanship matters. So what do I mean by that? The analogy I give to people is building a home. You can take two pieces of dirt, you can go to Home Depot and buy the exact same materials, put them on the dirt. You can hire somebody who's been building homes for 15 years and put them on one piece of dirt. You can put somebody who's never built a home on the other side. And the assumption that you will get the exact same homes is delusional, correct? So experience and craftsmanship matter, okay? So if you want a good hearing experience, you should be looking for a good craftsman, not worrying about the brand of plywood that the builder uses. And that's when you worry about the brand of the technology rather than the person who's putting the technology together. Does that make sense to people? I tell people hearing aids are a low confidence experience because patients don't know if they're hearing as best as possible. And that's what I hear over and over again. People don't know if they're hearing as best as possible. So carpentry, measure twice, cut once, right? And the reason is, is we should double check what we're doing to make sure we're not wasting. I will, can't tell you how many times people come and see me and they say, can I have a hot copy of my hearing test? And I answer universally every time, yes, of course you can. It's your test, it's your results, you should have them. More often than not, I say, what do you want it for? And their answer is, well, my hearing aid person wants to adjust my hearing aids off of your test. You think I'm kidding. How many people's hearing aid person adjusts off somebody else's test? People don't want to admit it. It's very common. And the point of the matter is, is that's where you've got somebody. Uh, people ask me, what should I do to screen people? I'll always say, one of the things you should do is, is if somebody's using somebody else's hearing test, that's not somebody I think you should be going to. So that's, I mean, the point is, is if they're not going to put the work in to measure before cutting, I'm not sure that's somebody you should do it. And it shouldn't be, oh, well, your insurance doesn't pay me or something like that. It's part of the work that needs to be done to demonstrate the craftsmanship to get you to hear well. People tell me this too. My hearing aid person is trying really hard and he's a nice guy. <laughs> so the example I give to people is a shoe salesman. If you go in and you have a size seven foot and you say to the shoe salesman, I have a size seven foot and they bring out a size eight, you say, well, I don't need a size eight, I need a size seven. Then they go in and get a size six and you say, no, not a size six, a size seven. Then they get a 10, and then they get a four, and then they get a nine and a half. What do you do? You leave, that's right. So my answer to you is earnest incompetence is still incompetence. So just because your hearing aid guy is a nice guy, and just because your hearing aid guy is trying hard, doesn't mean they're not incompetent. And that's what I hear all the, all the time, because you should be able to get to a comfortable fit in three periods. The second thing I'm going to tell you is, is people oftentimes are using fitting software. So have you, people come to say, well, you know, he gets on the computer and does all this stuff and the computer gives them a program and they keep on tweaking the computer. So going back to these multi-billion dollar companies, the way it works is you can return a hearing aid to a company for a certain number of days. It's different, 60, 30, 60, 90 days. If that device gets returned to the company, they refund the hearing aid person the cost of the device. They take off the container, repackage it, and send it back out. They realize zero revenue if the hearing aid is returned. So the fit software they have is not best fit. It's most comfortable fit. Because for them, they want to get you through the trial period. So they don't want you to hear uncomfortably. They want you to hear comfortably. 
The problem with that is, is if you get people to hear comfortably, it doesn't mean they're hearing as best as possible. So the software, people have to be willing to go off of the software and program itself for you. And if they don't know how to do that, that's probably a sign that they don't know what they're doing. But the software does not give best hearing fit, it gives most comfortable fit. And there's a difference. So if your hearing aids don't bother you when you wear them, but you can't hear, that's not a very useful device. Does that make sense? Oftentimes, so there is an article by two consumer reports, it's getting a little old, but 2012, they took 100 people, they took out their hearing aids, they tested their hearing loss, they tested their hearing aids. Two thirds of those people had hearing aids that were not adjusted correctly, two thirds. So they've invested, but they've made a poor investment. So what I tell people is it means they've got bozos pushing the buttons, right? So it ties back into the whole concept that craftsmanship matters, right? The work of communication is another thing. Now this is where the medical concept or the fact that this is now a medical, not a social issue. It is a social issue, but it's also a medical issue. So when you talk about the work of communication, the reason that people say I'm so tired by about four o'clock with hearing impairment is because what they're doing is, is they're lip reading, they're hearing part of the word, they're lip reading, so they're using lips to fill in the consonants, the F, the P, the S, and the D, because you can tell the difference between wife and wipe by looking at my lips. They're using context. So the example I give is the cat sat on the mat with a T makes more sense than the cat sat on the map. So you know what I'm saying, not because you hear the difference, but because your brain. But if you're doing that all the time, people with hearing loss are working really hard compared to everybody. So what I tell people is, it's like running with two 10 pound weights around your ankles. So you can do it, but it really stinks and it's a lot of work. So the concept isn't you can hear or you can't hear. Hearing loss leads to a more work of communication. Because I have all these people who have a hearing loss who come to me and say, I don't have a hearing loss. I go, what do you mean you don't have a hearing loss? Of course you have a hearing loss. It's like saying I don't have high blood pressure. The objective evidence indicates you have hearing loss. People don't think they have a hearing loss because they've compensated for it with lip reading and with contextual clues. And most of the people here have kind of grasped that they have it and they've kind of acquiesced to it and are doing something about it. But the real part of the failure in the medical community is getting upstream to those people who have a hearing loss, it's not treated, and they don't realize it because they're working so hard, okay? Why? Because increased work of communication cheats other processes. And the evidence is becoming pretty compelling that untreated hearing loss is associated with a higher incidence of dementia and memory problems. Why? Because if you're busy working to hear all day, you're not gonna have the brain energy to have normal memory and normal thought. Because the CPU, the brain, doesn't get more powerful as we age, it gets less powerful, so you're taking more of your CPU power to hear. I use high blood pressure as an example. It's a very common ailment. It's been aggressively treated by physicians for many decades. Why? Because we surmised that high blood pressure that wasn't treated was a high, associated with a higher risk of heart attack and stroke. And we started treating it before we had the evidence. So in the 40s and 50s, we started treating it. Hearing loss is associated with memory loss, dementia, negativism, anger, increased falls, social isolation, and depression. They're similar. They are medical problems that need to be treated. And it's much easier to go to your primary care doctor and get your blood pressure treated and much more likely than getting your hearing loss treated. And that's what has to change. So there's a concept of functional testing. So people have to understand the difference, what we're doing when we're testing. When, who in this room has had an audiogram? Like everybody, I would think, has had a hearing test, right? So when we do a hearing test, what we do is we test the health of the right ear, put it on a graph. We test the health of the left ear and put it on a graph. That is a measurement of the health of each individual ear. So it really isn't, and that's why it's called an audiogram, but it really isn't a hearing test because you're not actually testing people's ability to hear because we hear with our two ears together. That's functional testing. So anybody here who's had, gotten a cochlear implant they have likely had functional testing because in functional testing what we do is we put your two hearing aids in and we measure how well you understand with your hearing aids in. And in the current testing protocol with cochlear implants, we add a little bit of background noise 
because that's a little bit more like real life and that's functional testing. So people have to understand the difference between audiologic testing, which is measuring the health of each ear, as compared to functional testing, which is measuring true ability to comprehend and communicate. Does that make sense? So if you really want to see how well you do with your devices, you want functional testing, not just an audiogram. The real ear measurement that I talked about earlier measures the function of the hearing aid, but it doesn't actually measure the function of you. Because, as I said before, the hearing experience is the hearing aid, the ear canal, the eardrum, the cochlea, the nerve, and the brain. Functional testing measures all of that. Because that's really what you care about. You don't really care, well, everything works, but my cochlea doesn't. That doesn't really help you, right? Because if you can't communicate, you can't communicate. So you want to know that the whole thing works. Hearing aids versus hearing care. I think the medical profession is making a mistake when we tell people you need to get a hearing aid. When we do that, we're telling people to get a device. I think we should be telling people you need to get your hearing loss treated. Getting a hearing aid is getting a commodity. It's getting a physical object. It's getting something that we compare on price. And the most common place people get things on price are the same places where we go to get cheap toilet paper, meat, and trash bags. It's otherwise known as Sam's Club and Costco. So that is getting a hearing device. That is not getting hearing care. Hearing care is service and quality drives your selection. It's a totally different concept. So I know everybody here likely fits the demographic, gets the mailers that tell them two hearing aids for X number of dollars. You by and large hit that demographic. So the question I have for you is, is I do surgery. What would you think if I said I'm gonna give you half price surgery? <laughs> well, why is that funny? Discounted services don't make sense, right? They, they don't instill confidence. That's what these companies are doing when they discount the hearing aids. The devices cost the same to everyone. The only way they lower their price is by lowering their service. That's why two thirds of people have hearing devices that don't work well for them. Hearing aid versus hearing care. We believe in multidisciplinary coordinated care. I think you're gonna get your best hearing experience with an otologist, audiologist, CI audiologist, cochlear implant audiologist, diagnostic audiologist. We have audiologists who just do hearing aids. You want people who have an expertise and collaborate with other people to give you the best care possible. We, we, the community needs to be better committed to education and awareness because I think that that's the problem. It's not the technology, it's the awareness and education. And we offer basically you want a validated experience. What I tell people is you do not have to be satisfied with your hearing. What you need to know is your hearing as best as possible. So we might get you to the place where you hear as best as possible. Your satisfaction is your own. You have every right to not be happy with it, but there is a peace of mind knowing that you're hearing as best as possible because that's what everybody wants. We, we offer, at, at Arizona Hearing Center, we offer the full complement. We basically do hearing aids, assisted listening devices, ear lens. Ear lens is a novel hearing device that's out. It's a type of hearing aid where it's a direct drive device. It literally puts a little motor that drives your first bone of hearing with a little, they call it a photoreceptor, solar panel on the back, and the information and energy is sent down the ear canal with a laser and it basically has the ability to give higher levels of volume, broader spectrum of hearing. We actually have multiple patients who were cochlear implant candidates who have gotten into the ear lens and when we test them with the ear lens, they, are no, they don't no longer meet cochlear implant criteria because their understanding has been restored. So it's an interesting device. It's still developing, but it's definitely an interesting device. So this is what Consumer Reports said. Two thirds of hearing aids are not fit correctly. Your most consequential decision is finding the proper professional for whom to get hearing aids because it's likely to be a long-term relationship. Respondents gave doctor's offices high marks on their thoroughness in evaluating hearing loss that did respondents went to other types of providers. So if you wonder why you're not doing well, it might be how you're getting your hearing aids. Por approximately 20% 20 of people utilize hearing technology. That is the same percentage as 1985. We have gotten no more people to use on a percentage basis hearing technology than the number of people who are using them in 1985. 
The other interesting concept is in Europe where hearing aids are free, guess what percentage of people use hearing aids? 20%. So people always say it's price or cost that's the barrier. It's not. It's awareness. It's getting people to understand that hearing loss matters. Because pe people are willing to invest their time, energy, and resources into things that they believe that's matter. The problem is, is people don't necessarily know that hearing loss matters. The incidence of cochlear implant candidates is greater than the rate of implantation. So every day, more people become a cochlear implant candidate than the number of people we implant. <laughs> if we were talking about AIDS and more people were getting AIDS than we were treating or managing, we would call that an epidemic. There is a hearing loss epidemic out there, and that's why I've decided to come out and talk to people. Well, well-managed health problems, prevention, high-level awareness, monitoring, effective treatment, and patient compliance. And congratulations to HLAA, because that's what organizations like this are about, is talking about all of these things. Not just getting something stuck in your ear, not getting a hearing aid, but understanding the process. I heard uh, one of the cochlear implant patients today was talking about how uh, the doctor should make patients more aware that there's work on your part to learn how to use a cochlear implant. We, at our center, we give a slideshow to people, a PowerPoint presentation, and one of the things that I've been saying for the past 15 to 20 years is getting a cochlear implant is like getting a violin. Just because you get the instrument doesn't mean you know how to play. And that's what people have to understand. You're not downloading an app into your head. You're getting a device put in that you then need to learn how to use. And those are the things that are important is people sharing with each other their experiences, what the limitations are, and what they need to understand about it. That's kind of my potpourri of medical and issues about hearing loss. It's basically a culmination of things that I've written down as I talk to patients over and over again. And these are all different little vignettes and things I talk to my patients about on a day-to-day -day basis. And finally, I said, I need to put this down and get it out there. Because as I said, in my office, I'm doing it one patient at a time. It seems to be to make much more sense to be able to get it out to a broader audience. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, excuse me. If you have a question, I'm going to run to you with the microphone so, so that everybody people can hear. who use the loop can, <laughs> can hear. Or I'll repeat well. it. Okay. Or I'll repeat it. Uh, my office, so I have a statewide practice, if not a little bit more than statewide. I mean, I see patients from Las Vegas. I see patients from Yuma, Lakeside, all over. So my practice is downtown. It's at the convergence of the 101, the 60, the 17, the 51, which is basically where all the superhighways of Arizona, of, this, of the Maricopa converge. So the actual physical address is 3rd Street, just to the south of Thomas. It's pretty easy to find. Yeah, you basically go, I tend to the 3rd third, third Street exit ramp and then just go north, make a right. So. Anybody else questions? Uh huh. How do you treat them? There's multitude. You can watch them, you can radiate them, and you can remove them. There's a complex discussion of, and it's dependent on size, location, status of your hearing, your age, your health status. It's a pretty complex, uh, multiple consideration. So if you remove them, then is the person deaf? It depends. There's three ways to remove them. Some of them try to preserve hearing, some of them don't. So the status of your hearing matters and the size of the tumor matters. And that's why in the end it's a, I mean, I can't give you a simple answer, but for it really depends on multiple variables. I'll put it this way. The older you get, the less likely I am to recommend an operation. And what about tinnitus? Do you treat that? We do. We don't cure it. Right? Isn't that what I said? By and large, uh, the way you treat tinnitus is by getting more sound into your ear. So fundamentally, the number one treatment for tinnitus is be evaluated for hearing loss, which most people with tinnitus have, and have your hearing loss well treated. Once that goes, then we go from there. But that's the fundamental thing people have to do right away. So when I see people, they have a hearing loss, the first thing I tell them, treat your hearing loss, that will treat your tinnitus. So the concept is, is people think tinnitus is a different disease. It's not. It's a manifestation. So when I talked about hearing loss, I talked about those receptor cells in your ear, right? 
So when those receptor, seal, receptor cells degenerate, you get two things. You get a hearing loss and you get tinnitus. Right? So if I took a hammer and hit your knee, it would hurt and you couldn't walk. You wouldn't say, well, I have two problems. I can't walk and my knee hurts. The answer is I got hit by a hammer and I can't walk and my knee aches. Well, when you get hit by the hearing loss of aging, you can't hear and your ear aches. The way your ear aches is tinnitus. So treating the hearing loss treats the tinnitus. Yeah. Questions? There was a ton of information. It was very fast. Thank you. Thank you. Last chance? Question? Uh, two more. <coughs> Thank you, Doctor. It's been very informative. Uh, oh, you're welcome. I feel, uh, uh, I feel a, a little silly asking this question because there's so much data provided here. I should know the answer, but I want to ask, how do I go about this? How do I get started, and what's the process that's involved in availing myself? Like anything, the first thing you need is measurement, mm -hmm. right? So the first thing you need is a test to demonstrate that you have hearing loss. Once you have that, then it's deciding, having a conversation where people educate you about your hearing loss, the significance of it, and what your options are. How do I get that test? Uh, you're more than welcome. You call our office, we'll do a test on you. All right, thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, the point is, is that's the start, right? I mean, once you get the diagnosis, just like anything, I mean, not that it is, but if you got a diagnosis of cancer, then you'd want to learn about it, right? So it's the same thing. You get a diagnosis of hearing loss, you want to get it. So one of the things that I've really learned over my, my time of practice is the education is more valuable than the other stuff, right? So if you watch me in the office, I'll spend some time looking at your ear and all that. And then I spend most of my time, 85% of my time, educating you about your options and what you have going on. Because if you don't understand what you're going on, how can you intelligently decide what to do? So. And if I may add to that, if you become a candidate for cochlear implant, which maybe Dr. Sims could talk a little bit about candidacy, but in his office, he does have seminars beforehand, before surgery, that you hear from people who have implants. That's right. And you pretty much learn about the whole thing. I remember when I had my implant many years ago, I'm the kind of person that I really want to do my homework and I want to learn as much as possible. I wanted to be able to do the surgery, you know, that far. That yeah, in 2002, <laughs> there weren't a lot of resources for patients. <laughs> But I wanted, to, I wanted to learn a lot about it. So would you like to talk about the candidacy? Sure. So the candidacy is that concept when I talked about functional testing. So essentially, to test you, the, the screening audiogram does not predict cochlear implant candidacy. So I can tell you there are people I've seen a screening audiogram where I say they're definitely going to be a cochlear implant candidate, and they're not. And other people I say, I don't think they'll be a cochlear implant candidate, and they are. And that's because the audiogram, the hearing test, tests your right ear, then your left ear, not your ears together. It's not a functional test. So we do surgeries on people when you don't function well enough. The way to test you for a cochlear implant candidacy is to one, verify that your hearing aids are fit correctly for your hearing loss, and then put you in an environment where we test how well you understand and then introduce some background noise and see if you continue to understand. And if your understanding is poor and you meet certain criteria that it's poor enough, then a cochlear implant becomes an option for you. But fundamentally, we don't look at it as a cochlear implant evaluation. Our organization looks at it as a technology evaluation. Because when you come for a cochlear implant evaluation, the presumption is, is that's right, that's the conclusion. The question we're trying to answer is, what's the best technology for you? So we call it a technology evaluation because we're trying to figure out what can help you to hear better. It might be a cochlear implant. It might be your hearing aids need to be adjusted differently. It might be your hearing aids aren't powerful enough for you. So there's a lot of different things. That you do. Maybe it's a different one. So like I said, you know, the ear lens is another thing that, that maybe that's what you want rather than surgery. As an aside, I will say one of the things that's kind of cool about the ear lens, if you're interested in it, is there is a device called a comparator, which I don't think is a very good name, but it essentially will take your hearing aid and the ear lens and you can under ear headset compare the listening experience between the two. 
So that's an aside, but the, that's the thing. You do a functional test. The reason you got a cochlear implant is because functionally you didn't do well with your hearing aids, you didn't understand enough. And there are different criteria based on what the FDA says and what Medicare says, and we are pretty attuned to knowing whether or not people meet the criteria or not. What The other thing I will tell you is I have patients who come and say to me, I got evaluated for a cochlear implant, I'm not a candidate. We never tell people they're not a cochlear implant candidate. What we tell you them is, you're not a cochlear implant candidate yet because hearing loss is a, pr a continuum mm -hmm. and there's progression. So just because you aren't a cochlear implant candidate today doesn't mean you're not a cochlear implant candidate in a year. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is, is your hearing was normal and it's gone down. Past performance is the best predictor of future performance, meaning past hearing loss predicts future hearing mm -hmm. yearly. Okay, cool. I had a, a question about um, how you charge hearing aids. I've seen some commercials where um, the hearing aid had rechargeable batteries. And some do. Put them Consumers in. prefer not changing batteries. Is that something that more manufacturers are going to yes. versus batteries? Yes. At this time, what brand of hearing aids do, does your company dispense? All of them. I, I, I mean, all, all of the major manufacturers. Like, so for instance, Zounds is proprietary. We don't do that, but all the major ones. I have a friend who has been deaf since two and a half from during measles. He's now 57. <coughs> Would a cochlear implant maybe help, or is that a shock to the system to be able to hear at that age? That's not the fundamental challenge. The fundamental challenge with deafened, early deafened individuals is what is their speech and language status? Meaning if people haven't learned normal speech and language, um, now a two and a half year old oftentimes would, but if they haven't, you're not gonna get it. So if there are people who are what we call pre-lingually deafened adults, meaning people who never develop normal language skills, they are not going to get a cochlear implant at 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 and they'd be able to have normal language. And that's why I say it's not the technology, it's the whole thing. So the reason is, is the brain doesn't have the ability to develop those language skills. Your ability, your plasticity, your ability to develop normal language goes down significantly after about the age of five. So it depends on that. And then the other issue depends is if they were deafened by it, you then need to check the anatomical ability or the whether or not if he had calcification from meningitis, you can get uh, calcium deposits in your cochlea, which make implantation more challenging. So it doesn't mean it is. Lastly, fundamentally, the whole concept of cochlear implants working comes down to the individual's expectations. So when I give the seminar, what I talk about is this, my son playing baseball. If my son playing baseball and my expectations of him are this, that he plays little league and he plays as hard as he can and he does the best job as possible, I am likely not to be disappointed and I will likely say he's a good baseball player. If my expectations are he has to pitch in the ninth inning of game seven of the World Series with bases loaded, two outs, and a full count, I am highly likely to be disappointed. The only difference is my expectation. So when people tell you they got a cochlear implant and it didn't work, what they're really saying is I got a cochlear implant and it didn't do what I expected it to do and there's a difference. And that's why we spend a lot of time empowering patients to learn for themselves what a cochlear implant can and cannot do. And so for us, getting a cochlear implant's a process. It's not a procedure. And start to finish for us is about three months. So you don't meet somebody, some do, but by and large, you don't meet somebody and get married tomorrow. What you do is you meet somebody and you get to know them better and then you get married. It's usually a better formula for success. I'd say it's the same for cochlear implants. You really should understand what you're getting yourself into before you get one. People are so excited to hear better, they oftentimes rush through that and then learn about getting a cochlear implant afterwards. It's not a good process for them and it's not a good process for us. Thank you. You're welcome. Just uh, to add one thing to your question there, um, I had hearing loss for close to 50 years before I had my implant. And I 
had was told to keep my expectations reasonable, mm -hmm. you know, at the time because I had such long-term hearing loss too. And I thought, well, if I can only hear a little better than I can with hearing aids, that would that would make me happy. Deep down, I wanted it all. Well, see, I, I I say that I think there's a lot of what I call magical thinking. So we tell people, oh, you know, you might not be able to use the telephone. You might not be able to do this or that. And I think people go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm the one that it's going to work for. And so there is a process of people getting through the realization of the limitations. As long as you've had that dialogue and realize it, it doesn't become as much of a shock. Like what we don't want people to say is, is oh, if I'd known that, I wouldn't have gotten it. Right. That that because you can't take it out. So that's what we're looking for. But I do believe there's a lot of mag what I call magical thinking around cochlear implants. People believe that they're the one that it's going to be exceptional for. But you also have to work at it. That's correct. You do. You have to work hard. Yeah. I'm wearing uh, relatively new hearing aids at mm -hmm. this time, but I have a problem with one ear and it's un uncomfortable to insert it and in, have in, in, in back he's trimmed the hearing particles in the ear mm -hmm. and uh, he, it, it gets better but not better and uh, how much can they trim off something like that to make it become comfortable how much mold is so molds are not that's a mold what we call it molds are not just something that are put in your ear to get the hearing aid to retain. They're actually put in your ear to occlude the ear canal and drive the sound in. So that really is a question that comes down to how much hearing loss do you have and do you need a mold? And there are other materials that can be done. What I will tell you is there are two things. First off, many people have moved to the open fit where it's the dome. So most people here don't realize that at one point, everybody had a custom fit hearing device. Now they've gone to the dome. One of the downsides of these open fits or domes is the skills of the people fitting molds has gone down tremendously. So not as many people are as good at fitting molds. In fact, what we see is people who need molds who don't have them, where they have a hearing loss beyond what we call an open fit. But that, that's the issue. It's, it's a, I mean, I can't tell you specifically I, we don't typically in our organization have a mold that we can't make for a patient. Can they readjust the mold or redo a mold? Or? We don't have an experience where we typically can't get a mold that fits comfortably for a patient. Our organization, where I work, typically does not have many patients that we cannot get a mold to fit correctly. I mean, so. Here's the question. Your roof leaks. You have a roofer. You have a roofer already. I'm a roofer. You keep on asking me, can my other roofer fix my roof? I don't know. I can't speak for that. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, you're asking me about the skills of a craftsman that I don't know. What I'm telling you is, is in our craftsmanship, we typically don't have that problem. And so, because I'm not telling you it is that person. I don't know enough to tell you that it's necessarily that person. Any other questions? Anyone else? One more. We are going to get another microphone soon. We promise. Okay, good. How do you tell if your molds aren't properly fit? Well, so it depends on what your issue is. He knows it doesn't fit because it bothers him. If you mean, how do you know it doesn't fit from a hearing point of view? Again, so what we do, you know, when we do a technology evaluation that I talked about, it's not just for hearing aids. People in our organization get a technology evaluation when they're not hearing to the level of satisfaction or to as best as they think is possible. So when we do that, we'll evaluate your mold, for instance. So it's possible based on your hearing test, I can typically tell people like, you have a hearing loss where you should have a mold if you don't, and I can look at the physicality of the hearing aid and tell. Most people these days don't get a mold, they get an open fit, even the people who need one. The people who need molds are typically going without molds. I don't see a lot of molds anymore. I mean, 
the people who got molds are by and large people who have longer cochlear implants in this room because they all got molds. Right? I'm sure you have molds, right? Yeah. I was wondering if somebody has new, oops, I thought I was loud enough. They're all hearing impaired. <laughs> it's not loudness. Yeah, it's clarity. My husband's. Yeah, I learned a lot today about how to talk to him. Yeah. He's been poking me. Um, I was wondering, this gentleman has brand new hearing aids, mm -hmm. uh, but one isn't fitting right, right. for some reason. Right. Is that something you guys in your craftsmanship can adjust for sure. him? But it depends. There, unfortunately, it's a quagmire. So what I mean by that is, is you have a trial period. Okay. Right. Be earnest and be honest in your trial and harsh in your trial period, right? Because for some people, once you get past the trial period, it's yours. Okay. I mean, I will give you an example. Most places, so many states have a statute that says you need a 30-day trial. Arizona does not have that. It has no trial mandatory trial by by statute. Most places will give you a 30-day trial because everybody else gives a 30-day trial. We give a 75-day trial. Why? Because most people have not cognitively adapted to their hearing aids by the 30th day. So you're setting yourself up for failure by telling people, oh, you have 30 days, and after 30 days, you can't get your money back. People get anxious, and they say, I'm not going to keep these hearing aids, a good percentage of them. So the concept, I mean, it's just understanding the data, the literature, and tailoring your practice to things that make sense from a clinical point of view, not from a business point of view. So from our perspective, hearing aids that you buy that go into your nightstand drawer are useless. So that's what happens. They get them, they don't fit at 30 days and they put them back. So that's the thing. The other issue becomes there are locked hearing aids. So there are some hearing aids we can't adjust. And I think there are two sides to hearing aids being locked. I think some people are really good at this and should lock their hearing aids because they don't want other people to monkey with them. And I think that's actually reasonable. Many people have locked hearing aids because they want to force you to come back. Thank you. You're welcome.